Uh, on behalf of uh, the National Center for Good Governance, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Secretary Department of Administrative Reforms, uh, Sri Sanjay Singhji, the Chairman of our Managing Committee, to the NCGG's 14th webinar on uh, good governance practices. Today's uh, webinar is titled A Comparative History of the Civil Services of United States of America, Nigeria, and India. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Sri Sanjay Kothariji, who had advised us to con convene a webinar where the comparative history of civil services could be discussed. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome our two lead speakers, uh, Professor Meghna Sabarwal, the Professor and Department Head of Public and Nonprofit Management Program, University of Texas, a very visible face in the, the American Society of Public Administration and in the South Asian Society for Public Administration, as also Dr. Chukuka Onyekwena, the Executive Director, Center for Studies of the economies of Africa. In fact, this is the second time we are hosting Dr. Chuka in our NCGT event. We did have the opportunity to invite him in October 2020 as part of uh, a 26 country outreach for uh, good governance practices in a pandemic for African countries. So I also take this opportunity to invite senior faculty of public administration, some of the doyens like uh, Professor Ramesh Arora, Professor Rumki Basu, who have authored a number of books and who have been uh, leading thinkers on the subject. Before I invite Secretary DRPG for the inaugural address, I'd like to give a brief introduction of the subject on the comparative history of civil services. The role of the civil services has changed significantly from pre-independence days to current times. This to a large extent has been driven by the domestic environment and by the nature of responsibilities bearing on civil servants. Prior to the independence, the civil service responsibility was largely law and order, and today it is more of developmental administration. Also, the accountability levels of the civil servants have changed immensely. Today, there is an elected government, democratically elected government, to whom civil servants are answerable to. In addition to the CBC, the CBI, the CNAG, we have a former CBC in this meeting. And uh, the accountability levels have been very, very high. Further, in terms of uh, capacity building norms in terms of training programs, as also in terms of timely submission of annual performance reports, the nature of civil service has changed uh, distinctly. We'd like to bring today a comparative history of three civil services, the civil service of United States, the civil service of Nigeria, and the civil service of India. And uh, to deliver the inaugural address, I'd like to invite uh, Secretary, Department of Administrative Reforms and Public Grievances, Sri Sanjay Singhji, and I'll request Professor Poonam Singh to kindly introduce him to the audience. Professor Poonam, please. Yes. And kindly unmute yourself. Poonam. Yeah, we can't hear you. Kindly unmute yourself. Namaskar and good, good evening to all. Once again, I'm truly delighted to extend a warm welcome to all for joining today's webinar subjected on the comparative history of civil services of the United States of America, Nigeria, and India. So first of all, I would like to welcome our Secretary Sri Sanjay Singh, sir. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction about you uh, before uh, starting this uh, uh, webinar. Sri Sanjay Singh. He is an Indian Administrative Service Officer of 1987 batch, Madhya Pradesh cadre. Sir has an experience of around, around 33 years in civil service in various sectors and departments at the federal and state level of the government. Presently, Sir is the Secretary of Department of Administrative Reforms and Public Grievance and Department of Pension and Pensioners, Welfare Government of India, and Chairman of Management Committee and CGB, National Center for Good Governance. Sir was a special secretary in the Department of Agriculture and Research Education and secretary at Indian Council for Agriculture Research, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, Government of India. Prior to joining in Department of Agriculture and Research Education, Sir has also worked in the Ministry of Communication as Administrator, Universal Service Obligation Fund, where he was responsible for policy formulation and implementation of telecommunication infrastructure projects such as Bharat Net project to provide broadband connectivity through optical fiber cable, 
to over 250,000 gram panchayat. Gram panchayat is in India, grassroots institution, institution of village local self government, and mobile connectivity project to remote and un connected parts of the country. Sir has also worked in the Ministry of Rural Development and Development of Department of Consumer Affairs at the federal level. Sir has worked in the areas of school education, higher education, as well as skill development in the government. Sir is a postgraduate in international law and economics from World Trade Institute, Switzerland. Sir, most welcome, sir. I would like to request to begin this webinar with your time work. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Poonamji. Welcome, uh, sir. First of all, I would like to welcome Professor Meghna Sabarwalji, Professor, University of Texas, Dr. Chukwuka Onekwena, Executive Director, Center for Studies of, of the Economics of Africa, uh, Dr. Sanjay Kothari, our esteemed senior in the in the bureaucracy in the civil service in india uh, my my colleague uh, shrinivas and all other participants who are here today uh, the subject is very interesting comparative history of the three i'll say three largest democracies in three continents and uh, so uh, the, the way the civil services have grown i mean so the so, 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 we are going to learn from each other about the three different dimensions of the bureaucracy, the city civil service, how it has evolved over a period of time, what are the challenges which it confronted, and 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 currently what 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 uh, is on the agenda, how the reforms are taking place. Uh, I'll, I'll, as far as we are concerned in India, uh, bureaucracy, and the, for the first time, I'll say in the annals of uh, history, the word which is related to bureaucracy, I mean, it is, uh, it came up in around 300 BC. I mean, during the, uh, the Artha Shastra, which is a, uh, a treatise on economics uh, written by uh, a legendary Kautilya, I mean, there is there's a mention of Amatya. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's for the first time uh, this, this word was used. So it's 300 BC, this word was used. I mean, slowly the kind of transition which happened in bureaucracy at the point of time it was basically uh, very elevated and kind of a status which a bureaucrat enjoyed and after the sovereign the king the uh, uh, so this was a more most important position in the uh, uh, to in the entire i'll say the uh, structure of administration after that, I mean, it a lot of transitions happened. Then another another phase I would I would like to highlight is during the medieval times. I mean, I, I mean, ancient times, there is a mention in Kautilya, medieval times, and I think uh, it was it was around around uh, 1600 AD during the Akbar's time when Mansabdari, I mean, which was for the first time for the, for the, the during during that time. Uh, civil administration was provided a very very conspicuous and and definite role and so from there then the the civil services underwent another kind of transition during british india and in the, in the uh, pre independence time to begin with in the around 1600 the rule was purely mercantile in nature of the civil servants it uh, um, then there was a transition which happened where it took on the role of uh, the civil administration and uh, in the in the 19th century i'll say the late 19th and early 20th century uh, the role further evolved into very conspicuous and in terms of Delivery in terms of civil administration, in fact, all in one kind of civil civil services emanated, and uh, around 1930s, the, the recruitment and all for that the public service commission was set up, and the entire civil service was classified categorized into three categories. One was all India service, which we presently have. Second one was the civil central uh, services that also we have right now. 
and the third one was the provincial services that also exists right now. So, 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 so this was around 1913, and in, in 1946, a lot of I'll say the change in nomenclature happened from the civil service, Indian civil service, became Indian administrative service, Indian police service, and so on. But with the during the independent India, the role of civil services it magnified and a lot of complexities also uh, 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 were, were, were also the part of part of the civil service system because the new kind of systems in the governance, I mean, they were taking shape. For instance, I'll say at the village level, we have the Panchayati Raj systems. A similar kind of system system existed at the at the uh, 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 urban urban local bodies level as well. Then states, I mean, they by and large have the same kind of system. So the manner in which the I'll say the all India service uh, all India service contributed all India services contributed towards uh, uh, governance administration in the states. So that it's a no, it is it is it is good it is uh, it has been recognized in, in several uh, uh, several places and uh, uh, but nevertheless need for reform was uh, all pervasive all the time and uh, with the change in introduction of new systems with the change in policies of the government the need for a different kind of skill sets emanated. I think the current, if I can say, uh, towards that, uh, towards administrative reform in India, we have had two uh, administrative reform commissions. And uh, the first one was in 1966. It provided the roadmap for bureaucracy, the training, and a lot of, lot of very important uh, uh, developments, which we see today, like RTI, for instance, right, to information. I mean, that, that it came uh, out, out of the report of the Administrative Reform Commission of 1966. And then in 2005, we have another administrative reform commission, and uh, that provided a detailed roadmap about modernizing the, tech, the bureaucracy, the civil service, as well as in the sense of the policy formulation, architecture, and in terms of adopting the current technologies. And so, so, so towards that, lot of lot of. Uh, um, um, Guiding principles were laid down by Administrative Reform Commission, and they are being implemented during the course of. Uh, I mean, in in last few years, we have seen a uh, large number of such recommendations being being uh, implemented. And particularly, I'll mention ARC in 2005. I mean, it it deliberated in at length about uh, ethics. Uh, uh, I'll say local government architectures, capacity building, e-governance, and so on. So, so, so that, that's that's uh, the that provided broad roadmap and which is being implemented as I, as, I, as I mentioned. But as far as the reform in reality is concerned, I'll say to quite an extent these reforms have, have been triggered by the reforms in the policy space. When economic reforms happened, that necessitated a lot of lot of changes, lot of changes. Uh, in the uh, civil service, in terms of the skill set, in terms of capacity building, training, and in terms of the management practices, management processes which were in place, adopting the new technologies. For instance, I mean, it's uh, the, 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 the regulatory um, um, the bureaucracy, civil services. I mean, they they had to um, adopt uh, fintech, and so 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 these these kind of things were. Were all from uh, uh, was such which which really uh, uh, triggered the re reform phase and uh, 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 provided a, 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 a impetus to the uh, reform reform process in the in the in the civil service. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there have been um, challenges all through, and particularly I'll I'll mention I'll mention that. Uh, not so much the challenges. I mean, there's the criticism of bureaucracy. I mean, a lot of changes have been also uh, um, triggered because of the kind of criticism um, which uh, uh, um, uh, our civil service all over faces. So, like for instance, uh, 
uh, red tapeism is one of them, which which uh, we we all we all we all all, all of us uh, uh, in the in the in the civil service all through have faced, and uh, towards that, a lot of tools and a lot of uh, management process have been integrated. Then um, civil services are uh, 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 many things related to the red tapeism, like uh, too much of adherence to the. Uh, I'll say the rules and regulations of this another another thing, not not interpreting not interpreting the rules in constructive manner. So so, so these with, with these kind of uh, tools uh, with, with these kind of criticisms, um, they they generated different kind of another another set of reforms in the in the uh, uh, civil services, uh, which are primarily which are primarily the uh, technology driven reforms, and we are. Uh, bureaucracy, the civil service, I mean, it started adopting the new tools of administration. And the, currently, I'll say um, those tools are getting integrated with the higher level of technology, like uh, which provide artificial intelligence or machine learning and data analytics. So that, so that, I mean, these kind of, these kind of criticism, these kind of bottlenecks, which were there in the bureaucracy, I mean, they are really plucked. So uh, with these uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, reformative activities, reforms which happened in the in the in the in the, in the uh, civil service over a, over a period of time, uh, um, a, a new new kind of uh, policy formulation regarding training and capacity building, placement. I mean that came into being, and along with that came since the, so much emphasis was on ethics, and we have our ex. Uh, uh, Chief Vigilance Commissioner Dr. Sanjay Kothari also here. So a lot of lot of emphasis were on ethics and uh, accountability, and uh, so the, the, uh, the kind of policy being faced in the government is zero tolerance uh, kind of a policy, and where uh, so 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 um, so that was in the in the background. Uh, so then that provided the entire, I'll say, the change in the mindset of the bureaucrats in 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 uh, delivery. Uh, I would also like to mention a very, very recent uh, uh, policy intervention, policy declaration, which has happened in 2020. I mean, that is the mission Karmi Yogi. I mean, that is something which changes the entire uh, format of training, capacity building, as well as also the contours of uh, um, uh, capacity building. I mean, this basically is a national program for civil services capacity building. And uh, it not only provides the architecture, and this is learning. Uh, um, continuous learning is a is a, is a motto of this entire entire exercise, and this is this is this is driven with the objective of I'll say uh, um, shift from the rule based to the role based uh, bureaucracy, so that we develop competencies capacities. In individuals who can deliver in any 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 kind of role. so so and um, a lot of lot of lot of uh, new innovations are also also creeping in as a result of uh, this uh, mission karmiyogi which has been put in place so broadly in the indian indian uh, civil service i mean this has been the transition from ancient uh, um, uh, Civil, civil civil servants capacity and capacity building form formulation and format which which was there to the current one and this is the, 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 and and the, uh, the everything which is required currently by civil servants in terms of capacity building in terms of developing the management expertise i mean that is encapsulated under the vision karmi yogi which i just mentioned so this briefly this briefly is the uh, i'll say the transition of the civil service from uh, to the to the, to the um, uh, current level current phase and uh, uh, I, I thank you all for your uh, for your engagement and participation in in this uh, webinar and uh, and especially i would like to thank again uh, professor Varwal and uh, dr chukuka uh, and and uh, our esteemed senior dr sanjay Kuthari. thank you very much Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for uh, the ino inaugural remarks and the breadth of coverage that you've given for this webinar. 
I am also happy to welcome our former cabinet secretary, sir, Mr. Prabhat Kumar Ji, has joined this discussion a few minutes back when you were speaking. Uh, uh, I'll invite uh, our lead speaker, Professor Meghna Savarwal, to make the first presentation. And before she uh, makes her presentation, I'll request uh, Professor Poonam to kindly introduce uh, Professor Meghna. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Professor Meghna Sabarwal, uh, Professor and Department Head Public and uh, Non-Profit Management Program, University of Texas. She is a full professor and department head at the University of Texas at Dallas in the public and non-profit management program. Her research expertise lies in public human resource management, specifically comparative HR, workforce diversity and inclusion, job performance and job satisfaction. She has published over 50 peer-reviewed journal articles in public administration journals and is the winner of three best paper awards. She also has three book publications, Public Personal Administration, Sixth Era, Public Administration in South Asia, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, and a Public Administrator's Guide to Human Resource Information System, 2021. She has presented in over 150 national and international conferences and invited uh, talks. She is the recipient of the 2021 Outstanding Public HR Scholar Award by the American Society for Public Administration. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I would like to invite to begin this uh, webinar with your uh, beautiful presentation. Please welcome. Thank you so much for those kind words and a very warm welcome. Um, I hope you can see my screen, my full screen. Thank you yeah. very much. Well, uh, good evening to everybody in India. Good morning to people in the West. Good afternoon to those in Nigeria joining us. Um, so this is truly global in that sense, and I'm so excited to be part of this. I would like to first thank NCGG and specifically Mr. Srinivas uh, for inviting me to this talk on you know, the history of civil service reforms and in a comparative sense, US, India, and Nigeria. And it was a short conversation we had and we came up uh, with this uh, topic. So again, thank you. You know, I've been very impressed with his leadership and enthusiasm to connect with scholars and practitioners worldwide through these webinar series. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank the, the staff and everybody who's been working very hard, including Dr. Poonam Singh, um, who's been uh, kind of working behind the scenes to make all these webinars possible. And then uh, I'm very glad to see so many of my colleagues and esteemed colleagues on this call and civil servants. Um, very happy to welcome all of you. And thank you to Mr. Sanjay Kumar Singh, Secretary, uh, Department of Administrative Reforms and Public Grievances for that a very good talk on, you know, kind of walking us through the history of civil service in India, starting from 300 BC with Kautilya and the Arthashastra. I think that's so important, um, especially because in the Western world, we start off with Woodrow Wilson and we know that, you know, bureaucracies have existed much longer. So thank you for bringing a um, highlight to that. And so I do teach HR here in uh, human resource management, typically known as public personnel. It's a, a little older uh, verbiage and we we call it HR. And so I teach that and I recently uh, co-authored a chapter in the Handbook of Public Administration on human resource management in South Asia, which included India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Latin America, Caribbean, and the US. And so this talk that I'm going to do today will focus on, on US specific. I'll walk you through the historical events or the key events that happened in the US civil service history and how public personnel as we knew it then has evolved in the US. I think it's important to know the history of uh, any, any country of any system in this case, public personnel system, because we don't know where we are today if we don't know where we're coming from. And so uh, I'll walk you all through this, starting with the early roots uh, when the country was established when US was in 1789. So I would say that, you know, President George Washington, who was of course uh, the founder uh, of, of this nation, President Washington is usually credited with developing a competent civil service now although in principle he wanted a civil servants that uh, a service that was merit-based but in all reality 
social status played a big role. So unless you were an aristocrat or of the royal blood, so to say, you would not be serving in the government. And so that was the reality of when the civil services started in the early roots under Washington. And then under a few other presidents, President Jefferson, he was kind of truly the father of the spoils system. And I'll talk a little bit more about what spoils system means. Uh, but essentially, the criteria to serve in the government was if you had political party affiliation, did you show loyalty to your party uh, over competency? So, so those were very, very key, the patronage as we know it. Now, from 1800 to 1829, uh, the US political system became more democrat uh, democratic and it had more involvement from not just aristocrats. So there was a move away from elitism to bringing in more commoners into as, as they knew then uh, into the civil service system. Uh, and the trend of the spoils era really dominated through the whole 1800s. So what is the spoils era? President Andrew Jackson um, was, you know, very much about creating spoils where he said that um, spoils is nothing that, you know, something is spoiled, but it's a phrase that is used, which means to the victor belongs to spoils. So if you won the election, that means that that party should be bestowed with positions and rewards. So whoever helped win a presidency for that president, those people have to be put in the civil service. So that's the spoils era, it's called patronage as we know. And so uh, at the time, President um, Jackson, he basically fired all the previous federal government workers, there were a thousand of them. He fired them and, and then gave jobs to his own people and his own political supporters. So that was a time uh, with Andrew Jackson where loyalty was rewarded over competency. About, I would say, with the election of President Lincoln uh, in 1860, there was a discontentment with the spoil system and there was some weakening of spoils. There were a lot of government associations really speaking of the evils of this so-called spoil system. Um, and, you know, the spoil system overall had a negative impact on the government, as you can imagine, because it, it produced a corrupt government uh, that was more concerned with political party favoritism than with the needs of the citizens. Um, so, so to essentially summarize, the key features of the spoils era were public servants were predominantly chosen because of their political affiliation rather than their competencies. And every time a new government came in, the previous wave was totally, you know, fired, so to say, and a new, uh, new wave came in. So all of this, the, the short tenures, uh, lack of competencies, there was a lot of discontentment among, among people. Now the turning point really came when one disgruntled officer, you can see in this image uh, by the name Charles Guiteau, he assassinated President James Garfield. So that's President Garfield uh, at the Baltimore railway station. And he was assassinated because Charles Guiteau, he requested a job in a diplomatic service uh, and President Garfield ignored his request. And so he is essentially killed the president, assassinated him because he thought he deserved that position. He had helped him once in his political campaign. So, so this led to really, it was this, you say the straw that broke the camel's back. And this is what led to a reform uh, where in 1883, a Pendleton Act was passed that I'll talk about. But essentially that act is now, I would say starting of the reform of public and civil service system in the US. Um, Pendleton Act was passed in 1883. At the time, only 10% of public servants were covered in this act. And by about 1950, 90% uh, were covered under this. So what did this act do? It created a personnel system based on merit. So there was a test system introduced. Um, there was a central civil service commission 
um, competitive exams were put in, lateral entry was encouraged, and, and the neutrality of civil servants, which was very important uh, given uh, what all we, the US witnessed over time. Um, I, I will not talk about the, the test system today, but if you want to talk about it in maybe question answer round, we can uh, go over that a little bit. You know, unlike India, there's no central civil service testing um, that happens in the US. Of course, there are many federal jobs uh, that do their own testings. Uh, there are some central um, jobs that do have a civil service test, like the police, the fire, um, postal services, IRS, but <clears throat> we've done away with like a central civil service. So the, the one of the features, as, as you noted, uh, as I noted in the Pendleton Act was uh, a civil service commission, right? The Central Civil Service Commission was granted powers to uh, perform the major personnel functions. It was a central body through which all the hiring, all the firing, all the promotion, everything went through the Central Civil Service Commission. So as you can imagine, it was a very centralized system and it slowed things down. Um, and it also played a very policing role rather than a very, you know, a friendly cooperation role that was required of the personnel administration. Um, and it was it was heavily focused on the technicalities rather than putting issues of equity, representativeness, and the human at the center of it. So there was a discontentment uh, with this civil service commission, which eventually led to the Civil Service Reform Act. So from 1883 to 1978, the US was running under the so-called Pendleton Act. So for 95 years, um, and then this move came for the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978, which was uh, signed into law by President Carter, Jimmy Carter. Um, essentially what this did, and this is what we are operating in today in the US, there has not been a major a reform since the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978. What CSRA did essentially is it set up these four different key arms um, that, that run the government, the civil services. The one is the OPM, Office of Personnel Management. Um, and OPM, it serves as the chief HR or the personnel uh, policy manager of the federal government. It sets policies, human resource policies, leadership, uh, all of these are set by OPM. And it, it truly helps the federal workforce achieve their aspirations of you know, how to help the American people. So it's a central body. The next was the US Merit Systems Protection Board. And any merit violations are addressed to US Merit System Protection Board. The other one is FLRA, so any union disagreements, labor relations, all of those are, are going to FLRA, Federal Labor uh, Relations Authority. And then the fourth thing that was established was SES. SES is a senior executive service arm of the federal government. These people are beyond the regular scale. We have a great step and grade system, like most countries do. Uh, it's on a scale of GS 1 through 15. Um, so the SES don't belong to the scale, they are beyond. And, and they truly impact policies. They are the very senior ranking officials that, you know, I would probably compare to the IES officer um, in India. Like I said, there's not been a major overhaul or a reform since 1978, but we've had various commissions, various reports that have been put together. Uh, under President Clinton, the one that I would point out would be the most prominent was the National Performance Review, uh, which basically was chaired uh, by Al Gore, the vice president at the time, and his recommendations was reinvent the government from red tape to results. So the focus was very much about results, um, reducing uh, bureaucratic burdens, cutting the red tape, uh, empowering employees, downsizing. So all of that was very much part of 
uh, this this report on national performance review. You know, and also at the same time, remember in the 90s, there was a whole movement on new public management, right? And new public management, as we knew, focuses on efficiency, results, decentralization, things like that. So that was very much reflected in the government. I would say where we are today in the US um, is the managerialist period where there are reforms that focus on decentralization, which, you know, HR is very decentralized. Uh, while we have Office of Personnel Management, which is the central body of the federal government, um, at the state levels, local levels, uh, personnel is very decentralized. So in Texas, for instance, uh, there is no central uh, state body of HR. So there's no state agency. Uh, it, we only have a Texas Workforce Commission and that's about it, but it's mostly decentralized. So the decentralization theme is very much pervasive throughout. Uh, the other, I would say, HR reform that we are you know, focusing on in, in the US is performance-based pay. And that's got his own issues uh, because oftentimes, as you know, governments uh, lack resources, lack the, lack the money, so they are not able to pay for performance-based pay. Uh, and that then receives backlashes. Uh, but states have really radicalized um, based on these, re these reforms. The other one is declassification, uh, where essentially, as I mentioned, there are these step and grade systems. Um, and it's a rigid kind of a system where if you want to hire somebody at a higher level, you may not be able to, they're locked in to a system. So it, it's created declassification, which means you combine several grades and steps into one broader band. And so that gives a little more leeway to your manager at you know, where you are hired. Um, the other radical reform that we are seeing, especially in Georgia, Florida, and Texas, um, is employment at will, which means uh, you can be hired and fired at any time. And so this was something that was pushed by the governors of those states. They said that to keep the government efficient, uh, we need to have business-like practices, which means you can be hired and fired at, at any time. And so that received a lot of backlash. In fact, President uh, Trump in 2020 uh, so signed an executive order where he created a separate schedule called Schedule F, and he said, you know, we can fire uh, federal government employees at will. And so that what didn't sit well, as you can imagine. Uh, President Biden overturned that executive order, I think, within the first two days of his presidency. Um, and so that's been a theme, recurring theme, employment at will, and then of course privatization, which I think most all nations are seeing, including India. Well, I won't go into much detail, as I mentioned, Texas, Florida, and Georgia, where mostly you see these civil service reforms, but uh, about 28 more states are joining in, and they have some form of an employment at will arrangement. So the job security, of the traditional civil service employees has been really threatened. And what does it lead us to? What, what are the future of reforms here? And, and so there's some research going on on how employment at will uh, is going to impact uh, commitment, satisfaction of employees. And so the, the results have been mixed. Um, in fact, I did a study comparing India and US and I found that um, Indian civil servants had higher affective or organizational commitment than US and we speculate it's because of that higher job security um, that uh, civil servants in India do enjoy. So that's one thing that we'll see more and more research coming out when it comes to future of reforms. I'm working on some of them myself. Um, employment at will, there's some research that says is attractive in fact to our younger generation of workers because they do not wish to be tied down to one job for the rest of their life. So they like to move around, change sectors. And so that's that theme is going to stay, like I said, in the US. Uh, the other big challenge that I think the government is facing here and maybe in other countries, not so much in India, India has a very young uh, population, but in the US, um, 
it's this silver tsunami where, of course, you know, we have large retirements that are happening. It's an aging workforce in the government. And so the how can government attract and retain a new generation of highly qualified workers? And that's a big challenge. Um, there's some people working on it. Uh, Volcker Commission, NAPA, which is the National Administration of uh, uh, Public Administration, it's the National Association of Public Administration. So they have put out some reports really focusing on this issue of how can we attract a workforce, retain a workforce that can meet the needs of the 21st century, as uh, Mr. Sanjay Singh was saying, you know, we, we need highly trained professionals, uh, especially think about the cyberspace issues, uh, very complex, um, you know, cybersecurity issues. We need to attract people who can address those complex global economic issues. I mean, the pandemic we are in, it requires skill sets uh, that uh, need to be of the current century. So all these things the government is definitely grappling with how to attract top talent because you know it's hard when private sector pays three or four times more. So, so those are challenges uh, that uh, definitely US is working on and we need to modernize the ways in which we recruit, hire, train, uh, manage and retain these workers because hiring is another thing in the government, it takes forever. So those are things President Obama has worked on very seriously to reduce the time of hiring in the government. It used to be 180 days. I think during his tenure, it came down to about 108 days or so. So how can we continue doing those? And we are <laughs> due for, I think, a major overhaul, but um, no president is currently interested, at least uh, not at the moment, to make a big change. They are small things happening all across the government at the at the federal at the state and the local government so i'm going to stop there it was a lot of information <laughs> packed in a very short amount of time so you know feel free of course to send me an email if you have further questions or if i can help with anything else that i talked about and i look forward to the q a thank you so much Thank you, Professor Meghna. That was quite interesting in the broad sweep from the Pendleton Act to the Civil Service Act to the current status where you're looking at, uh, of course, the Indian model you did mention this does have huge number of attractions. Uh, I'd like to welcome our second lead speaker, Dr. Chukuka Onyekwena, and uh, he currently represents Nigeria and uh, was part of our NCGD webinar on uh, the good governance practices in a pandemic. We are happy to welcome you for the second time to the NCGG. And can I request uh, Professor Poonam to kindly introduce him to the audience? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Chikuka Onikwena is the executive director of the Center for the Study of Economics of Africa. He is also the chair of the Advisory Board of Africa portal, a member of the steering committee of the Southern Vice, and a member of the African Policy Circle. His research interests include foreign direct investment, trade, global economic governance, education quality, energy, agricultural productivity, and financial inclusion. He holds a PhD in economics from University of Portsmouth, UK, and executive foundation education certificates in rethinking financial inclusion and evaluating social programs from Harvard Kennedy School of Government and the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty, Poverty Action Lab, respectively. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, Ma'am, for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, um, for inviting me. Very um, important and relevant and also interesting webinar. Uh, thank you, NCGG, for organizing this webinar. I particularly like the, the comparative um, nature of the webinar in terms of comparing um, the three countries, the huge, huge countries in terms of um, um, population size and and, um, and also democracies that have um, existed over time. It's quite interesting from the last um, presentation by Professor Magna Savoal that the US and Nigeria are, 
uh, different levels of development. Um, I, I, I could also see some few um, intersections um, from some of the problems that the civil service in Nigeria um, is facing and some of the issues encountered in the history of uh, the US and the civil service. So thank you everyone for inviting me here and I will presentation on the history of Nigeria's um, civil um, service. So um, the, the, the Nigeria's civil service quite dynamic, um, which, uh, which reflects its um, colonial rule uh, uh, to independence and then the military era uh, uh, and then back to the civilian era. Um, and then there are now some persistent and ongoing issues in the Nigeria civil service, which I will um, highlight um, to, to a reasonable extent. So I will start from the civil service pre-independence. Um, Nigeria is a British, or was a British colony, created in 1914 by the merging of the Northern and Southern Protectorates. So um, the civil service in, in, was essentially installed by the British colonial administration, uh, and most of the senior civil servants were were the expatriates working in the extractive sectors, and then the Nigerians um, were mostly on unskilled um, labor, uh, as well as um, some basic junior level administrative. Um, roles. So um, the key features and issues within the pre-independence Nigeria civil service uh, um, ecosystem um, was more of agitations for inclusion of um, Nigerians in the civil service, of, you know, in the in the civil service, particularly at the senior level, uh, and also. Um, issues of low wages, trying to agitate for an increase in low wages and senior level participation of, of, of Nigerians in the civil service. And part of the strategy was to decentralize the administrative authorities, and this was seen as a, as a strategy towards um, increasing the inclusion of uh, Nigerians uh, in, in the civil service. And also the decentralization, you know, would now involve having distinct hierarchies as well as harmonizing wages, you know, and unifying wages, um, you know, agitations to unify wages between the expatriates and, and, and the Nigerians. You know, so those were the key issues pre-independence. And you know, you can see that most of the commissions and the recommendations uh, of the key commissions, for example, the Hunt Commission uh, was to review the wages of skilled workers, you know, to upgrade their standard of living. And there were also the Bridge Committee of 1941, um, which was to review the, the, the wages of workers in Lagos. Lagos was the capital of Nigeria. Um, even in the colonial government, you know. So, and then there was the Philipson Adebo uh, Commission of 1953, which were, was aimed at Nigerianization Niger status, that to increase the number of senior cadre of Nigerians as civil service. So it was essentially agitations and calls for inclusion of Nigerians uh, in the civil service that were dominated um, by the British um, expatriates. Um, so in terms of decentralization and hierarchies for independence, um, there was the Tudor Davis Commission of 1943, the Whole Foods Commission too, um, that recommended establishment of regional public service boards, and also the Gurush Commission, um, this is where the hierarchy that, um, that led to the creation of distinctive hierarchies in terms of separating professionals from administrative 
um, stuff during the pre pre colonial pre independence uh, Nigeria. Also, there were issues of harmonization of wages. The Libre Commission um, was aimed at grading and salary skills, um, trying to um, harmonize them based on rep responsibility as opposed to race. And then there was also the Popular Mbanefo Commission um, that aimed at unifying pay and conditions of service of all cadres and groups, you know, try to unify the payment structure to include Nigerians in the colonial administration. So that was um, civil service before independence. So in 1960, Nigeria achieved this, um, became an independent nation, and the British government bequeathed a parliamentary government you know, that was regionally decentralized into the West, East, and Northern region. And um, so those were the administrative authority, uh, authorities and powers in, in Nigeria. So in, in principle, and, you know, the civil service was largely apolitical and operationally, you know, at independence. Um, hiring and promotions were largely true competitive examinations, you know, um, there were hierarchies, you know, so there, there was a, a structure that was, you know, you know, quite efficient, in, you know, in relatively speaking, and, um, but there were still issues relating to the need to increase wages, you know, and also um, to strengthen the grading and uniformity um, issues. So, um, at independence, the, the, you know, there was a class structure, there was a fairly um, effective system that promoted uh, competence, uh, uh, competence uh, in the administrative um, structure of the civil service. So right after independence in the 60s and towards the 70s, you know, that there were, you know, other reforms, you know, but mind you, these reforms did not mean that they were actual, they were all implemented. It, it just shows the, the discussions and the issues and the recommendations of the period. And, you know, was, most of them were considered, some of them were just partially implemented, you know. Um, but pointing them out, you know, is just to understand the narrative and, within those areas. So within the 60s and 70s, the, concept, the, the focus was also on an upward review of wages and grading systems. And, uh, and commissions like the Morgan Commission, Iwood Commission, you know, were about upgrading salaries. The Adebo Commission, you know, actually specified a 30% increase for junior and senior staff um, respectively. Then the Dodgy Commission also recommended a unified grading and salary structure uh, for staff. So the major distortion in the era after independence was the the, the military era. Um, this era it's notable for really distorting the system that was fairly effective. Um, it's still being, you know, blamed for the degrade, degradation of the civil service um, because a lot of the effective efficiency and the competitive ways of um, recruiting staff, you know, they, they, they were all, all less considered um, during the military era. So um, they were more more about you know political um, factors and then you now see issues relating to patronage and loyalty seeking so 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 the, the civil service actually really became a platform you know for, for patronage and uh, and loyalty seeking for the military 
um, regimes. So they introduce a quota system of recruitment and promotion. And this quota system, you know, tends to uh, the criteria for, for recruitment is, is mainly for regional representation. So, so they brought about the a federal character principle because Nigeria is divided into different rating units, um, particularly divided by the north and south, and um, the hiring and recruitment of the social service was now more about how do we ensure that these federating units are, are represented in the system, you know, and, and it, the competence and you know, aspect of it was, was giving less attention. Also, as expected from military regimes, um, there was frequent changes of, of officials and dismissals and terminations uh, and these people were mostly um, exchanged for their loyalists. Um, and also, because it's now the civil service became a tool for, for to, to protect their regimes and expand their regimes, they, they, they also expanded the civil service considerably, you know, hugely expanded the, the civil service um, to, to, to capture a lot of their um, loyalists into the, into the system. So these, the military era marked a huge disruption um, to Nigeria's um, um, civil, civil service. So in particular, there was the one regime of 1966 that introduced the quota system and the Motala passenger regime of 1975 ushered in the federal character system and also massively dismissed civil servants without following legal um, procedures. Uh, the Buhari the regime and the Babangida regime of 1988 were also characterized uh, by massive um, dismissals. Uh, so these are the major distortions um, to Nigeria's um, civil service. However, amidst the liberatory regimes that dominated the 80s and 90s, there were still um, some key reforms. Um, again, it were, they were all um, aimed at, they were mostly aimed at in increasing um, salary structure and uh, working conditions. So the Dutton Philip Commission, AIDA Review Panel, they were all um, aimed at, um, you know, how do we improve the working conditions and salaries of, uh, of the civil, civil servants in, um, in Nigeria. And then came the, the democratic rule that Nigeria is currently under, which started in 1999. Um, the key aim was to demilitarize the civil service in, a, in accordance with the, with the, the constitution. And um, and there was a renewed, uh, you know, drive towards promoting efficiency, professionalism in the civil service. Um, there was some adjustment to the structure by restoring the head of the civil service, which was um, which was removed during the military era. Um, you know, and to provide political neutrality and cohesiveness. Uh, so there was this, you know, renewed effort at the, at, at the dawn of um, to promote effectiveness, you know, and to, you know, instill competence in, in, in the civil service um, of, of, of Nigeria. Also, um, these involve the creation of some planning commission uh, to that brings about the yearly development of the Nigeria, which is still remains. So, um, the, 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 the civil service reforms in 1999. That's need to promote uh, 
um, the, the, the vision of promoting um, efficiency and effectiveness. You know, so they were the ambassador reform of 2004, you know, aimed at restructuring you know, ministries and agencies. Uh, and then um, the Arab reform promotes professionalism and accountable workforce. However, However, the most robust um, committee sorry, this, the most uh, um, robust uh, reform, which is still under uh, still being considered for implementation, it, it, you know, just a, a small fraction of it has been it has been implemented, is a Steve Orasso year. Um, uh, committee of uh, of 2012, um, which really recommends a huge downsizing of the civil service. You know, um, the, the, the Russell report recommends the disband disbandment of 102 agencies um, from the present 263, abolishing of 38 agencies merging of 52 agencies and the reversal of 14 agencies um, to departments. Uh, this is a huge and um, it is huge, it's ambitious and it's, uh, you know, and it's, um, it's, it's an issue that is being hugely debated in Nigeria. How do we manage this RSA, uh reports that aims at downsizing and shrinking the Nigerian civil service. Um, as an economist, I know uh, from a public finance perspective, the civil service has increased the cost of governance. Uh, more than 70% of Nigeria revenue goes to towards paying salaries, recurrent expenditure, and a lot of the ministries and agencies have largely been unproductive. Uh, and so they they they, they have they, they have considered huge costs, and you know I am I'm also a proponent of really shrinking the Nigeria civil service um, significantly to you know, to promote efficiency and, and effectiveness. So the present day civil service. Nigeria is burdened with several issues. One is this poor numeration package of civil servants. Um, some levels still pay an equivalent of like 50,000 Naira, which is 100, about a hundred dollars monthly. Uh, and that is for uh, um, entry level salaries, you know, and over time, the, the civil service have been absorbing the the, um, the lower end of, of the population in terms of um, education, ability, and competence. So we have the issue of low qualification and limited relevant experience, where 70% of workers in the ministries were low-level staff, cleaners, and administrative staff, and 10% were university and graduates. Uh, decades of military rule, they, they instill, you know, they actually institutionalized corruption in, in, in Nigeria's civil service, and that has not stopped. Uh, there's still widespread corruption in, in Nigeria civil service. Uh, so the quota system and uh, the federal the character uh, system built by the military also brought about you know, tribalism and ethnicity, ethnicity in, in, in the civil service. There are still resistant issues now where, they, they, you know, they, they think that the civil service favors, you know, particular ethnic groups uh, more than others. Uh, uh, there's generally poor and negative attitude to work. You know, the work ethics of civil servants in Nigeria, is, it's generally poor. They, they have very limited incentives to be effective 
in the operations. Um, so this is the present structure of Nigeria Civil Service present upon its ministers, um, while the permanent secretaries are career civil servants, um, and it consists of directorates and then departments and services. And then this is the hierarchy, their heads and directorates and senior officers, while their directors are heads of divisions in departments. So what is the way for? Um, some recommendations is that, you know, in order to shrink um, the, 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 the civil service, we need to promote e-governance. You know, we need to employ ICT in a lot of um, activities to replace, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the responsibilities of the largely unproductive staff. So we need ICT in managing revenue collection, maintaining government accounts, and, and other administrative roles. Uh, um, there is need to improve management, you know, and remove incompetent staff by um, implementing the Rasonia recommendation of shrinking uh, the service hugely, the, the service hugely and also to be more rigorous in the selection process um, of, of, of mid-level officers. Uh, competency should, competence should be at the fore of recruitment, uh, and this could be achieved when, when um, the, 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 after the shrinking of the, uh, the, um, the, the national the civil service or, Nigeria. And then to also promote a lot of training, you know, of, our, of public officers. A lot of them are very backward in terms of um, use of I, of technological um, devices and adopting ICT procedures. Um, this, so they need a lot of training in terms of um, technology uh, adoption. So those are the persistent issues. Some of them uh, are. Uh, contemporarily in terms of the trends, where a lot of them are, uh, you know, come from the history, the, 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 the history that involved a lot of distortions, particularly the military rule. So that is, um, thank you very much everyone for kind of attention on Nigeria's um, civil service issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chuka. It is always uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to a Harvard graduate, and uh, thank you for presenting it. In fact, several clauses of what you said struck me as similar to what we had in the Indian civil service. The Nigerianization of the Nigerian civil service took a while to actually happen. Uh, the Indianization of the Indian civil service also took many years to happen. In fact, uh, political in nature, these are areas, there's a lot of commonality that I did find in your presentation with our civil service. For the first intervention, I would invite uh, one of our senior most officers of the Indian Administrative Service, Sri Sanjay Kothari, and with a brief introduction, Sri Sanjay Kothari ji served as Secretary Department of Administrative Reforms in the year 2012, and uh, then thereafter as Secretary in the Department of Personnel, and uh, thereafter as secretary to the president and uh, uh, then the uh, central vigilance commissioner he's a man well versed with uh, personal policies of india and having also served as secretary administrative reforms in the state government so he brings a wealth of experience and he was the man who had handheld us to convene this webinar uh, to understand the broad sweep of civil services across the world so, sir, may I invite you to make the first intervention on these presentations. Thank you, Srinivas. I know time is a constraint. Two, three things. Uh, I must compliment the paper. It's beautifully written. It's very absorbing. And this is the first time we are deliberating about the personal administration world over. So, it, it, it opens up a huge canvas I must compliment Mr. Sanjay Singh for a brief introduction about Indian civil service, starting from the uh, earlier time. 
He has briefly touched everything. Mrs. Uh, Meghna Sarbawal has given a very interesting uh, study of the U.S. civil service. And in particular, I would like to know more about U.S. bureaucracy and Indian bureaucracy on which you have worked in details. This takes me to another field, which I would like to share with you with a request also that this is the first time we all are hearing about the best and successful practices of various countries world over. We heard about Nigeria from Mr. Chukuka, very interesting how they changed, how they got independence, then the military role, and then the civil role. Then in particular, first look at the Commonwealth countries. What are their best practices? How have they come? Uh, out, uh, overcome their difficulties and even the developed world in Europe. I don't know how much work has been done, but that would be a very, very interesting area where we can look at. Then we also want to know something about Korea, Japan, very, very well administered countries. So my request to Mr. Sanjay Singh and my request to Mr. Srinivas is let us continue this process. If we have the best practices from various countries, I think we can look at our issues and see what new ideas can be generated. And I somehow understand that uh, Mrs. Magna Sabhawal is quite an authority on this. We have Mr. Chukuka. Let us get together and hold a regular series of this. There's very interesting observation made in the introduction, which I would like to read out. The three biggest economies in South Asia are India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. These nations have struggled to overcome their colonial legacy through, nu through numerous reforms. These reforms were not only difficult to achieve, but the most resisted within the public administrative administration system. We would like to know more about it. I won't take much of uh, your time. We have one of our very, very celebrated civil servants, our former cabinet secretary, Mr. Prabhat Kumar also. I would just end by flagging a very small issue. The lowest entity of administration in India is district. In some places, it is counties. In some places, it may be uh, some local body. What is the system of administration in these places and how is it going over centuries? That would be an interesting area. And as we go along, it, Mr. Sanjay Singh and Mr. Srinivas and all their team guests agree to this, we can have a continuous process in this wherein we can learn from each other the best practices. Thank you very much. I must compliment all of you for organizing an excellent webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It is indeed. Uh, we, we will take this initiative forward in the coming days. And uh, let me invite a celebrated author now, Professor Rumki Basu. And uh, she has written extensively about the civil services. In fact, I do have a book of hers with me uh, on uh, the Indian administrative Indian administration, which is which is one of the most widely read subjects in terms of public administration for uh, scholars. So, Professor Rumki, would you like to make an intervention, please? Um, let me congratulate um, DARPG for hosting this uh, or starting a series of seminars on comparative public administration and comparative public personnel reforms, which was really the thrust of uh, today's webinar. Uh, you know, it's it's been a learning experience for me listening to Meghna Sabarwal and uh, um, uh, Dr. Chuka and uh, looking at the history of, uh, you know, uh, the three democracies that we were discussing, India, uh, US, and Nigeria currently, uh, though Nigeria has had a disturbed uh, spell in their democratic, uh, you know, period, in the sense of their civil military relations that they've had, and which has greatly affected their public personnel system and the reforms. So uh, it was wonderful listening to you, but I am a little curious about the thrust of reforms uh, that um, Nigeria and US uh, is projecting currently. I will not go in back to the history that you've been discussing, 
But in the US, as I see it, uh, Meghna, uh, I have a couple of queries and I'm interested in knowing that, you know, have you completely done away with the rank classification? What is the classification, public personnel classification system that you currently have right now? Has it changed or are you thinking of changing? Because if you're talking of attracting talent from outside, you posed three questions here uh, and you said uh, the, the, you know, the, the thrust of the reforms are in three directions. How to make, how to attract talent, the best talent to the civil services, how to retain them and how to make them work for citizens. What exactly are the changes that have been envisaged for all these three uh, issues? This is something that uh, I would like to know specifically from you because we are talking of current uh, reforms in the US. Has anything changed systemically or is it broadly the same pattern that you always had that you know it's open competition and you attract talent from both all sectors at every rank of the civil service. And uh, as for uh, working for citizens, what are the public accountability issues uh, that you're projecting in your reforms, in the public personal reforms? How do you work, make it, uh, administration more citizen centric? Could you clarify on these two? And as for, uh, uh, Professor Chuka, I would like to ask you, uh, are you still struggling with, you know, as I see it, uh, you're talking of reforms, but the struggle is really towards a rule-based personnel system, which you probably have not achieved as yet. So the question of capacity building um, is another issue. Accountability to citizens becomes the third issue. So if you're talking of reforms, could you tell me whether you've really transited to a rule-based personnel system, number one. Secondly, uh, regarding personnel capacity building, you're talking of lower ranking officers not being included in the reform building efforts. You know, 70% of your personnel, you said, have nothing to do with training. Why is that so? And thirdly, how to make citizens uh, feel that reforms are affecting them on the ground. So how do you look to citizen-centric administration? Could you please clarify on all these three? Uh, Meghna can start and uh, Professor Chuka can follow. Uh, thank you for those uh, comments, uh, both uh, Mr. Sanjay Kotari and, and Professor Basu. Uh, your first question was about the classification system if they still exist, how they are, if they exist at all. So in the federal government, which is equal to the central government in India, uh, there are 2 million government employees at the federal level. And those are under the classification of GS, which is called general schedule one through 15. And they are these are the one through 15 levels, starting with the lowest level of uh, you know, clerical, they move on to technical, administrative, and professional, beyond which is the SES, Senior Executive Service. They don't fall under the GS 1 through the 15. So, yes, there is at the federal government. At the state level, the police, the fire, uh, they are very much under the civil service system, uh, whereas other state agencies may not have uh, this kind of a rigid, they still have some sort of a classification where they are, uh, of course, hired into, but they don't have this rigid GS 1 through 15. This, this still is. At the local, which has 11 million employees, so state has 5 million, uh, and, and so the local is where the rubber meets the road, as we say, and I liked that point about we really need to be focusing on that local, the county, district level. I hope we'll do more of that in the future. But that's where you truly have a lateral entry system. Uh, of course, like I said, the police fire still adhere to the civil service uh, classification. But the local is where you can, it's an open competition. There's lateral entry, there's lateral movement. That's where schools like ours uh, that teach public administration become very important because we are training the future of uh, government. Um, so so we, we do take into account things like ethics is very important, right? You were talking about your second question, I think, was 
what things are important or what is the thrust uh, of this change and these reforms. One of the big issue and the big thrust and I'm working on and that I'm seeing more and more is this issue of representativeness and inclusion and equity. Social equity is at the heart of, of course, there are pillars of public administration, as we know, accountability, ethics, uh, efficiency, effectiveness. But the other, the key that's emerging and more and more research is being done on that issue is social equity and inclusion. And so I think that moving further, how can we create um, a bureaucracy that's not just representative of the people it serves, but also is truly inclusive in the way that who's making the policy? Are they truly uh, representative of the citizens they serve? So I think that's going to be very important. Of course, issues of ethical governance, um, that's, that's always at the heart of it. But um, issues of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the government is very important. There's a, there's a new committee now. They're working on modernization of Congress. And so this is a, a big part of that that they're working on, uh, how to make governments truly inclusive of the people they serve. And we can talk more. I think that's a whole different topic on accountability. Exactly. And uh, but but I I you know would of course leave it to Dr. Chukuka to answer your comments, and then we can come back and have continued conversations. Thank you. Dr. For those Chuka, questions. please. Dr. Chuka. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Runki, for those um, questions. Uh, one was on if Nigeria is a, has implemented a rule based personnel management system, and um, another is on capacity building. In terms of um, rule-based personnel management system, um, I must say there is no, uh, I'm not aware about any robust or comprehensive rule-based personnel management system in the Nigerian civil service. Uh, capacity building in the Nigerian civil service um, is, is part of the uh, practice, but it differs according to, across um, ministries. But I, I, in answering your question, I'll, I'll point to a more fundamental issue in the civil service that also um, influences or, or, or affects um, how the internal practices of, of, of the entire civil service. Um, and it is the revenue sharing structure of, of Nigeria, you know. Nigeria is oil dependent. Um, a lot of, our revenue, of the revenue of the country um, is from the sale of crude oil. Um, that crude oil gets into a pool for, you know, old FAC. And, um, and that FAC is distributed across different um, ministries. Um, however, there are some agencies and parastatals um, that's, that's really generates revenue from the private sector, for example, regulatory bodies um, like the NCC that regulates um, telecommunications um, operators generates revenues um, from the telecoms op operators. So those ones have um, a better revenue base, you know, and um, and if you if you if you look at those kind of agencies, they have state of the art practices. They invest in capacity building of their staff. You know, they they tend to use the revenue they generate and internalize it, in, internalize it into improving your operations and promoting better working conditions for staff, as opposed to the the administrative uh, ministries that do not. That they do not raise the revenue, they depend on their location from the government. And those ones are the way where there are huge gaps in efficiencies in their practices, in the in the, in the operations and, and and conditions of service. So that disparity um, in, on their revenue structure, you know, also affects um, you know issues concerning capacity building and, and also. Um, and, and even the effectiveness. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chuka. I have a young colleague who's an award-winning uh, officer for, and also a topper of the civil service, Mr. Krishna Bhaskar, and he's joined us from Sirisilla in Telangana. And uh, uh, Krishna, can you uh, pose your question, please, uh, briefly? And then I can give the floor to Professor Ramesh Arora. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm very sorry I'm not uh, able to join through video because we've had a power breakdown here. Uh, very shortly, sir, I, I just have uh, uh, one particular uh, question, sir. Now, inclusivity has been talked about by all the speakers in uh, this panel, and uh, they've shed a lot of light on that matter. What we have found in the district is there are layers of uh, inclusivity which is accepted by people on the ground. For example, for a big project taken up by government, we noticed that uh, the focus on inclusivity goes to a very high degree with civil society getting involved. But in many cases, uh, even uh, people who otherwise would be deemed to be affected parties in, an, uh, in a government project, when it's at a much smaller scale, done uh, with uh, uh, much lesser intervention, somehow seem to uh, believe that government probably places more emphasis than they themselves. Uh, there is this layering of expecting inclusivity at different levels based on the nature and the scope of the project involved. Uh, government, however, has uh, the same set of regulations which deal with them very uniformly. Uh, would any of the speakers believe that in the future, there could be something like a rider clause where people are allowed, like for example, uh, uh, when you submit industrial applications, you're, you're able to uh, submit an affidavit on your own, declaring what uh, you've been uh, able to install, so that you will be liable at a later date. You, would that be a possible development in the future? Because that would clear up a lot of matters on the ground and people would feel uh, quite involved with the projects being taken up. Uh, thank you, Krishna. In fact, Krishna has just passed out from MIT sir, and uh, brings a lot of experience. I'll also invite Professor Ramesh Arora for a brief uh, intervention, and then I'll request the speakers to take both questions together. Um, thank you very much. My first question is to Professor Meghna. Um, very good exposition of the history of US civil service. But I think uh, we should also mention about the impact of Hoover Commissions, both Hoover Commissions and the Brown Book Committee. I'm really interested in knowing as to the uh, executive office of the president, which was set up after Brown Book Committee's recommendation. How is it still growing stronger every day? And the presidential form of government agreed. But this office is certainly sometimes overpowering and overshadowing the various departments of the government, the 15 of them. And uh, my second question is, uh, what happened to the Civil Service Commission? Why it was necessary to disband it in 1978? What went wrong? And if there is no other institution which is covering the various functions which are performed by the Civil Service Commission, uh, don't you think there is a gap? Don't you think there is a lacuna? And after this, I certainly have one question for Mr. Chuka, but not now. First, Professor Meghna. Thank you for those questions, Professor Arora. Yes, definitely Brownlow and the Hoover Commissions have had a big impact. I did not want this to be in 15 minutes to go through a lot, but I should have definitely mentioned those. And, and their impact continues today in terms of uh, how presidencies and the executive uh, arm of the government is, is quite powerful, especially we saw that with the last presidency. Uh, where we we did see a lot of changes uh, in the federal government uh, suggested via executive orders, which again, as we know, with the new president, uh, those have been overturned uh, very quickly. And so uh, it's hard to bring about uh, reform, at least in the civil service, uh, that is bipartisan and that will be voted on, on from the both sides uh, of the aisle. And so that I think becomes very, very difficult when it comes to uh, forming uh, or at least passing legislation and reform that is bipartisan. Uh, as you know, uh, it's a very divided uh, government in, in, in the US, you know. Uh, so, so I think that, that does continue to impact, but a, a lot of it does become a reflection of who is in power in terms of the president. You remember during 9-11, President Bush uh, passed some, tried to reform the entire Department of uh, 
Homeland Security, Department of Defense, and, and transform the entire personnel system. He was successful to some extent, but they realized it wasn't working the way it was supposed to be. So they have now gone back uh, to the general schedule system I was talking about. Um, so we've seen these uh, changes with presidencies, and I think that will continue for sure. Um, but going to your second question, and um, remind me again, Professor, <laughs> what your second question was. Civil Service Commission. Civil Service, why what is disbanded? Well, the Civil Service Commission, what they saw was the central body as the government was growing and getting more specialized and the needs at all levels were becoming more specialized. It was very cumbersome is what they found that if local government and at the state level you have to employ or hire someone, everything had to be funneled through uh, the Civil Service Commission. Earlier, it was much easier, right? You had smaller governments. The government today is 18 million strong. Uh, only civil servant employees I'm talking about was a whole shadow government, right? Those contract workers that I don't even count about. The 18 million don't even take into account the US Postal Service and the military arm, that's a separate. So it's as the government was expanding they, uh, and as the market kind of you know, um, based reforms were coming in, this whole idea of centralization, as you know, has been a big theme in the US. There's, there was heavy decentralization uh, from the central. OPM still serves as the central body, Office of Personnel Management, but they do not interfere into the day-to-day. -day. They do help formulate some of the key policies that, you know, state and local governments have to follow. But in terms of recruitment, in terms of promotion, in terms of evaluation, that is very much left up to the individual, uh, either it's the local government or at the state level and state agencies to hire, fire, promote, bring in, bring changes. So it, it, it is a heavily decentralized, which in a way was argued for better efficiency. Um, and, and there's been definitely, I think, research that shows that that is an efficient system uh, where there's a central body that makes key policies but the rest is left to the individual units so they are they are there's there's uh, good and bad right there's always the the plus and the minuses of any system uh, but so far the decentralized system does uh, does turn to work now there is one caveat there that i'd like to mention with decentralization um, some some scholars have argued that it is going to bring back the spoil system uh, because too much power is put into the line manager. Um, so that's another, there's research ongoing in that area, but I appreciate your questions. Thank you. Dr. Pachuka, would you like to take Krishna's question on equity? Can rephrase the question. No, uh, so, um, yes. Yeah, so um, I attempt to answer the question on inclus inclusivity. Yes. Uh, um, but the question asked um, the dimension he asked it is not the dimension he plays out in Nigeria. Um, inclusivity in Nigeria civil service, uh, it's about uh, regional representation, and um, that's the the issue. So inclusivity, from my view, um, is one of the issues that promote inefficiency um, in the system. Because um, Nigeria is a system that mandates every state to be represented in the government. For example, um, there are 36 states in Nigeria, and the ministers must confess. I do not consider that an effective system. Um, whereby you have to ensure um, that you, you you appoint um, technocrats, especially for for, for um, positions that involve um, tech, you know, high technical ability. Um, the, the system that promotes you know inclusion in terms of regional representation um, has proved not to be very a very efficient um, system for Nigeria. So it's about the issue. The, the, there is now the parks of funds, um, inclusion in terms of regional representation, because some regions in Nigeria 
um, have historical deficiencies in education attainment. And, um, how do you balance that with promoting efficiency in the system? So those are the kind of issues that we face in Nigeria. You need to you need to have an inclusive government where the regions are represented. However, you know the technical needs uh, and competence requirements of of of, of um, the civil service might not align with um, the regional you know regional distribution of, of talents and, and, and competence. Thank so, you very so that's, much. That's, that's the issue, how it plays out Thank in the Nigeria. May I now invite Secretary DRPG for any concluding observations? Nothing, nothing particularly, Srinivas, just, uh, um, I mean, as, uh, and stated by Dr. Kothari, I think we would take this endeavor to next level. And now, I mean, this is the this is the base which has been set up through, through the uh, participation of, uh, as I mentioned, the three, three largest democracies in the three different continents. And your in civil service reforms and civil service roadmap, which uh, which exists for uh, reforms and so on. So uh, now we will take it to the next level, and especially uh, the, the, the countries which you mentioned by Mr. Dr. Kotari. Till now, in, in smaller groups, I mean, like this one, we'll uh, hold these kind of uh, uh, discussion and deliberations. And that's just from me. Again, I uh, extend my thanks to everybody, Dr. Sabarwal, uh, Dr. Choko, and uh, Dr. Sindhya Kothari and uh, everybody thank you very much thank you sir thank uh, you for this thank you for this offer secretary drpg it'll be a good exercise if we all learn from each other <laughs> yes uh, there are a lot of young uh, uh, is officers in the web room and uh, who uh, uh, requested for more discussion time as uh, professor meghna has indicated and also dr chuka has indicated please send us the questions and we'll send them by email and uh, We'll uh, get their responses for you. We have to close at 7.30, so I'll invite uh, Professor Poonam to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Professor Poonam. Ji, kindly unmute yourself. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to propose a vote of thanks to you all, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sri Sanjay Kothari, sir, former uh, chairman, Civil Service Com uh, Vigilance Commission. Sir, uh, we cannot forget your kind contribution which you have given during, during your tenure uh, in NCGG. And uh, especially, I am very, very thankful that I worked under your kind guidance and you always listen to us. And, uh, um, so we are very, very thankful and grateful to you, sir, and also very grateful to joining today, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, uh, also, we would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Secretary Department of Administrative Reforms and Public Grievance, Government of India, and Chairman of Management Committee, NCGG, Sri Sanjay Kumar Singh, sir, for gracing this auspicious, auspicious event and addressing the participants at the inaugural session and sir also ncgg uh, is very very thankful to you sir you always listen our uh, suggestions and our, our address during your uh, uh, during the project presentation sir during our presentation so thank you so much sir for your kind presence and uh, uh, addressing the participants at the inaugural session we are very thankful to our esteemed speakers professor meghna sabarwal uh, Dr. Chukuka uh, Onikwena, for accepting our inv invite to share your vast experience in respective fields with the uh, audience. I'm sure that all participants have benefited a lot. Now, on behalf of NCGG team, we express our sincere gratitude to our Director General Sri V. Srinivas and Additional Secretary DRPG, sir, who has given uh, immense support and guidance to make this event a grand success. Thank you so much, sir.
Uh, we would like to appreciate the audience of this webinar comprising of previous speakers of Good Governance webinar series of NCGG, leading faculties of public administration over 100 in the state of India, district collectors for aspirational districts, faculties of public policy of Indian Institute of Management, resource person of NCGG, senior officials from DRPG. We are really thankful and grateful to all for participating in this auspicious event. Finally, I would like to thank the entire team of NCG who are working behind the curtain. Thank you all for your gracious presence at this event and have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.